two of a message I started last week on In Jesus in Ephesians chapter 1. We'll be there so you can find that in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8 through 12 today. And we're looking in this section of Scripture there in chapter 1 about In Jesus. We learned last week Paul encouraged us by the benefits that we have of being in Jesus. And Paul will expound further on these benefits of being in Jesus today. Last week, let me remind you, if you were not here, uh, of the benefit of being in Jesus, that the believers are saved by, the sacri- by his sacrifice. We are saved by his sacrifice. Paul spoke about redemption last week, and we learned about the details of that redemption. We know the three benefits of being saved by his sacrifice. We have redemption through his blood. We also have the removal of our sins. And then we learned also we have riches of his grace. Boy, if nothing else excites you today or in your days, in your life, you ought to be excited about that every Every day we have we have redemption through His blood. We have uh, we have the removal of our sins. We've been forgiven of all of our sins. Then we also have riches of His grace. The Lord Jesus has brought us out of the slave market of sin and set us free. Uh, he, di- he did that by dying on the cross for us, shedding his blood, giving his life for us. And redeemed, we're to praise him. As we just sang about a few minutes ago, we've been redeemed. God had gave us out according to his riches. We learned that last week, not out of his riches, but according to his riches. God gave his son to the world, and Jesus gave himself for the world. That's grace. So we move now as we continue in this theme today. We're talking about uh, the benefits of being in Jesus. In Jesus, uh, we are saved by his sacrifice. So if you're physically able, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's holy and perfect word. We pick back up in part two of this message, In Jesus. We're going to read verses 8 through 12 this morning. You follow along. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8 through 12. You follow along now, for this now is the word of our great God. The Bible says, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him... Also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. You may be seated as you're praying with me this morning. Father, would you open our minds and our hearts to receive your message today. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak today mighty, powerfully. Lord, there'd be no doubt. The who's speaking today, not me, that they not hear from the pastor, but Lord, they'd hear from the master today. Lord, I pray you get me out of the way and just preach your word through me. Remind us, Lord, uplift us, encourage us about what we have in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for Ephesians chapter 1. Remind us of these great treasures we have in Christ. And Lord, for those who may not be in Christ today, today would be the day of salvation. They would, their, op- their eyes and their, uh, and their heart and their, and their mind they'll open their understanding that they may see themselves in light of you and your word, that they may come to Christ and be saved today. Lord, I pray you would do a work and draw people to yourself in this place today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we looked at the word redemption last week in verse 7. We looked at the details. Number two, if you follow along with me in your outline, notice the re- word revelation. Uh, there's, Paul gives a revelation by way of declaration. He makes a declaration in verse 8 and 9. The, notice verse 8 with me, the declaration, the message of grace abounded to his people. He says that in verse 8, uh, in which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. So Paul makes a declaration. What's this declaration about? We've got to go back to the last part of verse 7. He said in the last part of verse 7, according to the riches of his grace. Now, New Testament wasn't written with verse numbers. Those were added later on. So this, in the context, what did, what, what did he make abound towards us? His grace, the riches of his grace. It's the Lord's grace that has abounded towards us, towards his people. The word abound there, parousio, means to superabound in quality and in quantity. (laughs) That's a good word. Uh, It means to remain over, uh, to remain and over and above. What does that mean, preacher? Well, we need to thank him for his overwhelming, overflowing, and ongoing grace every day towards his people. Grace is not going away from us, but it's abounding towards us. Thank God for that. God's grace is not running from us. Hallelujah. It's abounding towards us. 
I don't know if y'all getting that. I'm thank God I'm, I'm getting it. The people of God should be gracious. Why? Because we've been saved by grace. We stand in grace. And we've been transformed by the grace of God. The world needs to see we have been transformed by the grace of God. We have received the redemption through his blood. We have received the removal of all of our sins. We have received the riches of his grace. And on top of all of that wonderful blessing, here's some great icing on the cake. God has given us wisdom and prudence, verse 11, uh, verse 8, excuse me, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. The word wisdom, we get our words, the word Sophia comes from that Greek word, is that Greek word, wisdom. It's understanding the knowledge of the deep things of God, his word, his will, his ways. God's given us wisdom. And if you don't have wisdom, Something's wrong. God gives it. If you lack wisdom, listen to what James said in James 1 verse 5. I put it on the screen. He said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God gives us wisdom. The Lord has given us wisdom to know his word and to know his will. The people of God have an understanding uh, from the Lord of, on spiritual matters, uh, on the context of life and the living. We, uh, we have an understanding on insight uh, to live in. God's grace about, uh, has abounded to his people in all wisdom and prudence. And listen, let me remind you today that wisdom is not in short supply. God's wisdom towards his people is not lacking. Do you need wisdom? Seek the Lord. Get into his word. Pray. Ask him. Matter of fact, Solomon will write Proverbs 2, verse 6 and 7. He said, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. God gives wisdom. Let me give you a biblical illustration about the difference of wisdom and prudence. Solomon had asked for wisdom from the Lord when he became king. And it, his request so pleased God that he didn't ask for riches and uh, to, to dominate the nations around him or honor in the world. So what happened? God gave him that. God gave him wisdom, but on top of that, God gave him, uh, God gave him riches and honor. Uh, there was none likened to Solomon. Uh, God gave him wisdom and honor and riches above any before, uh, before him. So Solomon was wise. You've heard it said Solomon was with the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon was one of the wisest, wisest person in the world. But having wisdom and using wisdom is two different things. Solomon had wisdom, but Solomon didn't always use his wisdom that he had. Solomon made a lot of bad choices. I want to give you a synopsis of Solomon's life in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. You can read it with me. I don't want to just quote it to you. You can read it with me. Listen to what the Bible says. 1 Kings 11, verse 1 through 4. But Solomon, King Solomon, loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Listen to what the Bible says. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart, for it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. Solomon had wisdom, but he didn't use his wisdom. And by the way, let me speak to my elderly folks here today. Don't let the world turn your heart away from being faithful to Jesus. Like Solomon. Solomon should have been walking with the Lord all those years. He should have been a strong believer, grounded, a faithful disciple of a God. But was he? Oh, no. He was full of sin. He chose the wrong things. Solomon had wisdom in abundance, but he was lacking in prudence. But the Bible says, Paul says, what is available and abounding towards us is wisdom and prudence. Solomon needed prudence, which is given for us to live by the word of God. Solomon made bad choices. He went off, followed these false gods, worshiped those false gods, set up high places to those false gods, turned his heart away from the Lord. You and I need prudence. 
We need wisdom, but we also need prudence. What is that word prudence? The New American Standard translates that word insight. It's from the Greek word that emphasizes practical understanding, comprehension of the needs, the problems, and principles of everyday living. It stresses the practically handling of daily affairs. It is a skill of knowing how to apply the wisdom and knowledge in our day in and day out activities in our lives. How we live out our faith. That's what it means. Donald Cantrell said, we have all of the wisdom and prudence that we need as we read the scriptures and listen to the Holy Spirit. God has not left us to find wisdom at the expense of the world. He has abounded in giving us wisdom. The word abound means that he has exceeding and excelling and overflowing us with the ability to have wisdom. This abounding also involves the ability to understand his will and to make the proper use of his wisdom. The world has to depend upon merely earthly understanding, but as believers we have been entrusted with an abundance of wisdom and an abundance of understanding. It is one thing to have enlightenment and another to be able to understand how to use it. Boy, the world's lacking in that today, amen. He goes on to say, God has made sure that we are well stocked in divine wisdom and understanding. God wants you to live according to his word. We cannot live like the world and walk in fellowship with Jesus. We cannot fill our minds with worldly and carnal things and be spiritually minded in Christ's like. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> Godliness in, Hey, godliness will work out. God has saved us and forgiven us. God has brought us and brought us into the family of God to be his church in the world. We are rich in Christ Jesus, and we are to live for him. So we've talked about, verse 8, the message of his grace which abounded uh, to his people. Look in verse 9 with me. There's the mystery of his will according to his purpose. In verse 9, Paul says, Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which, is, which he purposed in himself. So we have wisdom and insight abounding towards us because God has made known to us the mystery of his will. Having made known. You see that in your Bible? What does that mean, preacher? Well, that means it's beyond our figuring out. Uh, it is impossible for us to obtain by effort it is not understood by our intelligence. You can't read, read, read enough books out in the world to get it. It is made known to us. God has made known to us the mystery. That this is something that God made known to us that was previously unknown by us. The word mystery, by the way, is Greek word is mysterion. Mysterion, it means something previously hidden, a secret not yet revealed, or something only confided to the initiated and not to just anyone. This word is used 22 times in the New Testament. Lewis, uh, Lewis Perry Chafer in his commentary on Ephesians said this about this word. He said, in the New Testament, sense of the word a mystery is a truth undiscoverable apart from revelation and usually refers to something not clearly disclosed in the Old Testament but now revealed in the New Testament. The word mysterion had two meanings in Hellenistic Greek. Two basic words, this, this way this word was used. The word, first of all, was used to describe the rites and the practices of the heathen, heathen religions. They were initiated into those rites and those secrets. This word was also used to describe something God reveals, and that's what, the way that Paul used it. The Jews used the word to describe some secret plan that God would reveal at the end of the age. In the New Testament, the word refers to a truth formerly hidden but now made known to the believers. So this mystery was revealed by God to his church according to his good pleasure. What does that mean, preacher? Well, that means no one had to pressure God to reveal it. That means no one had to bend his arm and twist his ear or weary him through nagging. It was God's good pleasure which God purposed in himself. It was God's will and plan to bring about salvation full and free through his Son. What was concealed in the Old Testament has been f fully revealed in the New Testament. The saints of God receive the Son of God and are forgiven of all their sins and are redeemed through the Lord's sacrificial death and the shedding of his blood on Calvary's cross. The mystery of his will is revealed to the church. Have you understood what Jesus did for you? Do you grasp what Jesus is doing in and through you? So we've talked about the word in verse 7, redemption, the details. Then we looked at Revelation and in verse 8 and 9, the declaration. Then look at the word reason in verse 10. What was the reason he did this? He, he tells us in verse 10 about the design. God has a plan and a design for all these things that's going to come together. Paul mentions in verse 10 the time that is coming. He says that in the dispensation 
of the fullness of the times. So Paul will further lay out the purposes of God in revealing the mystery of his will. That word that uh, connects a purposeful statement to what he just declared. God had made known to the saints the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, that in the dispensation to come. So Paul speaks of what the Lord has done in the past, but also what he will do in the future. The word dispensation there, the Greek word means administration. Uh, it, it referred to a, an administration uh, of a household or a estate, uh, a stewardship. So it refers to the management of an estate or a household. So the set times are in God's hands, and God is administering things according to his plans, and by his power, that ought to encourage you today, amen? Uh, I mean, the fullness of the times refers to God's working out his will in the world. Remember Galatians 4, 4 says, In the fullness of the time God sent forth his Son. So that tells us that Jesus was born in time and on time. He didn't come before his time or after he should have come. He was in time, on time. And let me remind you today what, Je what Paul's t teaching us today, that the Lord Jesus will come back and rule the world in time and on time. The word times there uh, that Paul refers to was not the passage of time, not the days or months. Uh, it's for the Greek, he don't use the word chronos where we get a word chronology. He's not talking about chronological time here. It's the word keros. It means, refers to epochs and seasons, and, and it refers to the end times, those times that are God's alone. So we live in such a world. Listen to our current events and societal struggles, the darkness everywhere. Uh, I'm describing where we live in today. Amen. A hopelessness in people, that does not thwart the plans of God. The world's going from bad to worse, but as believers, we can discern the times, have wisdom from God, and know that all things are working according to his will and ultimate purposes. The world, let me remind you today, the world is not out of God's control, but it is in God's control. History is in the hands of God. God is handling, planning, arranging, and administrating all things toward a climactic consummation in Christ and for his believers, his followers. Lehman Strauss said the times or seasons suggest that God is developing his plan through a series of definite and successive stages, the fullness of which has not yet come. However, it is God's intention in the final important season to send his son to earth again to sum up all things in him. Amen. So Paul tells us in verse 10 about the time that is coming. He also tells us about the task of the Christ. He says in verse 10 that he might... See that in verse 10? He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. That's what I'm preaching on, in Christ, what, in Jesus. What do we have? Have you ever heard someone say, maybe you've said this before. Maybe you've said this a lot in your, your life. And you keep wondering, how can I get any worse? But maybe you've said this and you've asked this question. What in the world is the world coming to? What is the world coming to? You ever said that? Things look bad and often go from bad to worse. Things look bleak. Darkness permeates our society. What is the world coming to? Paul would tell us in verse 10 that the world is coming to Jesus. That's what he's telling us today. He said he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So the Lord Jesus will gather all things in one in himself, all that are in heaven and that are on earth. So the Lord Jesus is coming again, and he will reign in great power. Uh, he will come and defeat the enemies of God and all those Christ rejectors he will put down. He will destroy Satan and his demonic minions and his kingdom and cast them into the lake of fire forever. He will set, up all, he, he will set all things right, and those who know him will reign with him and be blessed with him forever. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. John Philip said it was Jesus who came to earth, incarnated himself in human flesh, lived a life wholly pleasing to God, and then bled and died in agony to make God's mercy and redemption available to us. Listen to this. He said, God has no plan, no program, no purpose that does not ultimately rest in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There will be a great gathering by the Lord of all things in heaven and on earth. The Lord's going to gather it all. 
I mean, he made it all. He can gather it all. Amen. He spoke the world into being and the galaxies. He has all power in heaven and on earth. The Lord will reclaim, will reclaim this fallen world, restore order from the dysfunction, sin, and chaos. It is Jesus that his, that his church is and that the world will be under his authority one day. It is the Lord Jesus. R. Kent Hughes speaking about Jesus said this, He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. All things came out of him and all things will return to him. Thus all creation is moving towards its consummation in him. Hallelujah. All things will be gathered together in one in Christ. There will be no division, no dysfunction, no distance, no defiance, no disobedience when Jesus reigns. When Jesus comes again and rules and reigns, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's coming. I love what all Yacht Stewart in his commentary on Ephesians said. Listen to this. I put this on the screen for you. He said, The time is coming when all things shall be under the rule of Christ. This present rebellious universe will not always remain in defiance. Soon there will not be any sort of authority in it anywhere except that, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. All delegated authority will be gone, and he will rule directly. All who have shown dissatisfaction with him will acknowledge him as Lord. The universe thrown into disorientation through man's sin will be brought back to its original orderliness and unity as everything everywhere submits to Christ. He says this does not mean that everyone is, is at last going to be saved. But it does mean that those who have mocked him will see him elevated. No other name will be honored. Unconverted men and women do not even think about such a climactic ending to history. But it is no secret to us. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Folks going to give an account to him. One day we won't have to go to the ballot box for an election. Amen. Ain't nobody going to elect Jesus. He's king of kings and lord of lords. Nobody going to vote him out of office. They not, may not have submitted to him in life, but they will after life. They will bow before him, confess that Jesus is Lord before they're cast into hell. Paul reminds us of the benefits of being in Jesus. We have been saved by a sacrifice. It's God's plan and power that brought this about. So before I move on to my next point, I need to ask you, are you in Jesus? Have you been, have you been saved by his sacrifice? Are you in Christ? Not only are we saved, believers are saved by a sacrifice. Number two, won't you see in verse 11 and 12 in your outline today that we are, we are so selected and supplied. Believers have been selected and supplied. Verse 11 and 12, there's four great truths. Don't you, uh, you see there in your outline, don't you see before we move on and close out this morning, don't you continue worshiping the Lord with me as we study this passage. Notice the possession of God's people. He says in verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. So Paul speaks of the possession of God's people. God's people have been selected and supplied. We've not only been saved by a sacrifice, we've been selected and supplied. Uh, we've been, we've been, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace. But we also, uh, in him, we have also have obtained an inheritance. I don't know if you've ever obtained an inheritance. But if you say, let me, remind, let me give you some good news this morning. You have obtained an inheritance. <laughs> Amen. I read this story in my studies this week about a man who, who was worth $20 million who left everything to his only descendant, a young nephew. The problem was that no one knew where the young nephew lived. The lawyer traced him to Colorado, but then the trail ended. So he contacted a detective agency for help. The head of the agency said, I'll put my best detective on the case. case. She is young and sharp and opportunistic and aggressive. She'll find you, man. Three weeks later, she contacted the detective. She said, I found you, man. The lawyer said, great, when will he back? When will he be back? And she answered, we'll be back right after our honeymoon. That's one way to get in on an inheritance, amen. But we have even greater inheritance than that. And we do not have to use trickery or cunning to get in on it. It becomes ours when we have come to Jesus and trusted in him for our salvation. Paul says that in Jesus we have obtained an inheritance. Amen. Now, let me be fair to the Greek language and, and what it says. That obtained an inheritance is one word in the Greek. It means to a lot, to a sign. Uh, the word's an aorist tense word in the, in the passive indicative sense. Well, you don't know. What does that mean? Well, it speaks of something in the future that is without a doubt guaranteed. 
It's guaranteed. Our inheritance cannot be stolen, taken away. And the government cannot come and take it from you. Rust and moth will not get it. And listen, thieves will not break in and store, steal it. Amen. It's a guaranteed inheritance. Now, this word, this, this, these words in the Greek construction of the sentence allows for two possible translations, both being grammatically and theologically correct. This word uh, could refer to the believers as being an inheritance, which stresses that the believers are Christ's possession and the treasure that are treasured by Christ. And that's true. That's biblically true. The, the other way is used is in our, in our translation in the New King James, which say we have in, obtained an inheritance. Now, one of those stresses what, what Jesus has in us, but I believe in the context, this, uh, we have obtained an inheritance is the, is the, is the right context because we're not stressing what Jesus has in us, but what we have in Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. So the, this stresses the, uh, not the, the possession by us, but it stresses that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. We belong to him and he belongs to us. We are his special children and treasure and inheritance. And in him we are gar guaranteed a glorious and eternal inheritance. Both are biblically true and glorious. 1 Peter 1 verse 4 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1 4. So in Jesus we have obtained an inheritance. Amen. And we do not have to wait to claim it. Even though our inheritance is reserved in heaven, and it is, but it also is beneficial on earth right now. We ought to be, get, be getting in on our inheritance and be sharing uh, about our inheritance in, in heaven. The Paul speaks of the possession of God's people. Then look, notice with me in verse 11 uh, the, the word predestination. He talks again about the predestination of God's people. He says, being predestined being predestined. This is the second time Paul uses this word within the context, verse 5 through 11. First time he used it in verse 5, uh, that God predestined us to adoption as sons of, uh, of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. Then in verse 11 he uses the word again to reinforce the, uh, that believers state in Christ. The word means to limit in advance, to predetermine, to determine beforehand, to ordain. So God's people have been predetermined predestined and marked off for God's purposes. Believers have been selected and supplied by the Lord. We have obtained an inheritance in Jesus and we have been predestined by Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. The church of God, the, the church is God's blood-bought special treasure, a family that belongs to him. Now remember, when we talk about the word predestination and election, it always deals with God's people and God's purposes in them and for them. I, I covered that in my sermon on election by God. You can go back and watch it if you missed it. It's on YouTube. Go back and watch it. I covered that in that, that message. So we've talked about, the, Paul speaks about the possession of God's people, the predestination of, of, of God's people. Notice verse 11, the purposes for God's people. What purposes? He said, according uh, to the purpose of him who works all things. So here Paul puts the spotlight on God's power, on God's power and, and purpose in selecting his people. Don't ever be deceived into thinking that God is not working. Don't ever be deceived. God is at work in the world. He's at work bringing people to Jesus. He's at work conforming his people to Jesus. He's at work in the world to glorify Jesus. God has a purpose in his work and his will. The church has been saved by the Lord to live for the Lord and be his people in the world. God's work in his people. We are his representatives in the world. That word work there, and in his work, see that in verse 11? According to the purpose of him who works, uh, that, that we get our word energy or energetic or energize. Some of y'all need that right now. Amen. Y'all need, need some energetic energy. Uh, God, that tells us God is active, that God is working. He's not idle. He's not passive. He's not disengaged. He's not apathetic. God is working. God is at work. And the Bible says he works all things. That reminds us that he is limitless and his power is never diminished. We know he's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. We know he's omniscient. He's all going. This verse magnifies that he's omnipotent as well. He's working in all things. God is omnipotent. 
He's at work throughout the ages. The times are in his hands and his purposes will be done. Paul reminds the church of God's power. Then notice also in verse 11, God's plan according to the counsel of, of his will. Wow. God's plans will never be thwarted. It may look from the human perspective, and that's where we look through sometimes the eyes of the flesh. We're here on the earth. We're humans. And from the human perspective, it may look like the world's out of control, that society is in turmoil, that, that they just, folks are burning down cities, that people are without hope and without help. But God's plans are right on track and right on schedule. His perfect will and ultimate will and plans will be completed. By his counsel, that Greek word boule means a, a volition, his, his purpose, his counsel, his will. So the purposes of God in and for his people will be carried out and brought to completion. Nothing or no one will stop the Lord. Nobody can stop the Lord. The Bible tells us of the possession of God's people, the predestination of God's people, the purposes for God's people. Then lastly, verse 12, notice the praises. The praise is because of God's people. Look in verse 12 with me. The Bible says, this is what we have in Jesus. And he said that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Wow. Paul reveals the end goal and response because of God's work for God's people. God's will, God will be praised and glorified in his people, through his people, and for his people. The preacher of the world ain't praising God for us right now. They will, amen. Paul includes himself in those who had first trusted in Jesus Christ. The early believers, listen to me, believed the good news and trusted in Christ in the midst of major trials and persecution and pressure. The prospect of troubles and trials and persecution didn't hinder them from turning to Jesus and trusting in Jesus and living for Jesus. They laid it all on the line for Jesus because they were in Jesus. Listen, each succeeding generation of believers should carry the torch and trust in Christ and bring praise and honor to Jesus in their lives and through their lives. You should. Roy Gingrich said this, I put this on the screen, he said, We are the bride of Christ, the new Eve, who will someday in the millennial age assist Christ in bringing the universe under his headship. God predestined us and gave us a portion in his program for Christ that men might see his glory, his grace in choosing us and giving us this portion, and praise his glory. The future ages will yet be praising God's grace shown to his church. Amen. Salvation is found in Christ and should rebound uh, from us to the praises of Christ and his people uh, to the, in the world. Only the Lord deserves our praise and honor and glory. We're to be shining for him. We're to be singing his praises. We're to be causing others to praise God. Now, I, I may have to confess and repent because if I ask this question today, and I say, when y'all see Pastor Jack, do y'all say, Lord, thank you for Pastor Jack. Lord, I see Jesus in him. He's an encouragement. To, that's the way it should be. And it should be that from us. Lord, thank you, Brother Ray. Thank you for working his heart. You, you remind me of Jesus, Lord, and you're working that. We ought to be bringing praise to Jesus. Let us dwell on the benefits that we have in being in Jesus. We have been saved by the sacrifice, uh, uh, his sacrifice, and we have been selected and supplied. We're to live for the glory and praise of our Lord and Master today. Don't, don't wait to get to heaven. You say, well, when I get to heaven, I'll be perfect. Well, that's right. But the one who lives in us is perfect today. And he wants us to be growing and be glowing and be going for Jesus. John R. Stott said this. I love what he wrote. He said, then if we shared the apostles' perspective, we would also share his praise. For doctrine leads to doxology as well as to duty. Life would become worship and we would, we would bless God constantly for having blessed us so richly in Christ. We're forgetful sometimes of what we have in Jesus. We need to be reminded. Is your life lived for the praise and honor of Jesus in glory? Listen, we will celebrate the Lord for all eternity like never before. Not be hindered by this old flesh. But I'm telling you, until then, we're to be practicing. We're to be growing. We're to be getting better at it. Amen. <laughs> We're to be ongoing, being faithful, living, faithfully living for Jesus and honoring him in all of our lives. Now, right now, we are the objects of his, of his love and mercy. But we're also to be the subjects of his glory. We're to be 
rebounding with praise for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So the church, hey, it's on us to reflect the love of Jesus and shine the light of Jesus and sing the praises of Jesus in the world. I know you guys have been taken in all. You've been to places I've never been. Some of you have been out to the Grand Canyon. You just look majestic at that big hole in the ground. Or you look up to the sky and see the beautiful mountaintops, snow-covered mountaintops up to the sky, the clouds and all the beauty. Can I tell you the holes in the ground and the clouds in the sky is not bringing praise to Jesus. That may think, it may make some people think about God as creator, but they don't think about Jesus as Savior. That's our job. We're to be shining for Jesus. We're to be singing his praises. They're not just to see us, and we live in such a way they see us, they, they can think about Jesus, but they'll be hearing from us as well as we sing his praises. Hallelujah. Might go Baptocostal in here this morning. I'm still Baptist, amen. Are you in Jesus today? Have you been saved by his sacrifice? Do you have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of your sins and the riches of his grace? Do you have wisdom from God and prudence in your living? I encourage you today. I mean, I believe Solomon went to heaven, but he got to get right at the end of his life. You read the book of Ecclesiastes. Boy, it was a, a depressing book. Don't read it if you're depressed. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, it might hurt you instead of help you. I'm telling you not to read the Bible. Lord, forgive me. <laughs> that part of it's pretty rough. Solomon wrote, every, all's vanity. Everything's vanity. He had it all, tried it all, but he had wisdom, but he didn't live by it. Let me ask you today, are you living with prudence? making decisions, godly decisions based on the wisdom of God and the Word of God. Don't make stupid choices. Stupid is a stupid... Who said that? Uh, Forrest Gump. There you go. Don't be stupid. Amen. We need... We got wisdom. If you don't, you're lacking in it, ask God for it. Submit to Him. He'll give you wisdom. Do you understand the purpose of God in sending Jesus and the purposes of Jesus. I've covered a lot of things this morning in this passage, a great deep passage about what God's going to do in Christ at the end of the ages. And his people are going to be with him and reign with him. Uh, he's going to be glorified in and through his church. And let's not wait to the millennial age to give him praise, amen. Let's do it now and forevermore. Have you obtained an in eternal inheritance? Are you sure today that God's your Father, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that you have an inheritance in heaven. Start using it. Start basking in it. Start boasting in the Lord. Bragging on Him for what He is and what He's done for us in saving our souls. We have an eternal inheritance. Let's reflect our relationship with God. Would you trust in the Lord today? If you've not been saved, uh, those riches uh, that we've been talking about being in Jesus can be yours if you'll trust in him today. If you'll turn to him from your sin and by faith call upon him. Ask him to save you. You'll receive uh, forgiveness of all your sins. You'll receive redemption through his blood and the riches of his grace today. And are you thankful, church, for the benefits of being in Jesus? I'm not through. I couldn't preach all this at verse 13 and verse 14. Next week, I'm going to give you a, pre, uh, a preview. Next week, part three in Jesus. Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14. Go home, read that this week, and meditate on that. And pray for your pastor as I get ready to preach on that next Sunday as well. But you need to come today. Surrender to him. Seek him. Follow him. Rejoice in him. And let's live to bring praise and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word today. And I just pray right now that your word would not return into you void. But Lord, let it accomplish what you please and prosper in the thing for which you sent it. Lord, thank you for those great truths. Lord, they're just not principles we read about in a, in a text. And we thank you for your word and the power of your word. Your word's living and sharper than any two-edged sword. But, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have changed us, that you have saved those who have trusted in Jesus, that those who are in Jesus have been saved by his sacrifice. Lord, we have been selected and supplied. And let us live to bring forth the praises to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, give us wisdom and prudence to live in a godly manner in a wicked world. And we give you praise now. Lord, as we make decisions right now to surrender to you, Lord, as we make decisions to share your gospel and, Lord, to sing your praises, let us surrender first and foremost everything that we have, that we might love the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, Lord, bless this invitation time is our prayer. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing a hymn of invitation this morning.